and also uh, take advantage of um, some of our hosted services like um, insights at, Red Hat, at console.redhat.com. Um, and just a little plug here for those that don't know, uh, insights will do stuff like look for security vulnerabilities. Um, what else will it do? It will um, let you know how to fix it. It will provide an Ansible playbook so that you can do a push button remediation on those vulnerabilities that it finds. OK, cool. So tell us a little bit about Satellite and, and the projects it's based on. Is, is Satellite itself open source? Are there upstream projects that are providing um, for Satellite? Absolutely. Um, like all Red Hat products, there is an op upstream open source uh, uh, combination of these products. So um, first of all, uh, the content management system is uh, provided by the Pulp project. Um, this is all uh, then managed through the uh, Foreman project. Um, we've got Candlepin that allows you to manage subscriptions. Um, and um, there's a whole bunch of stuff out there. So where, where Red Hat offers value here is we provide we, we combine all of these projects and we make sure that they all work together well. And um, yeah, just ensure that uh, you have the tools that you need to manage your hosts. That sounds good. So. So Eric had, had mentioned Satellite 6.10 was just released. I'm actually in the process of upgrading my Satellite server right now. Tell us a little bit about you know, what's new in Satellite 6.10 and, and what some of the cool new features are. Yeah. Um, so before I get into that, Eric, can you pop in the link to the uh, 6.10 uh, software? Uh, yes, I can. And my, my apologies to uh, to our RHEL YouTubers. Uh, we went live in all the right places except on RHEL YouTube. So that's that's been corrected now. So welcome to the show. Um, and you wanted the Satellite 6.10 link. Let me put that yeah. in. For, forgive, the, uh, forgive the host for being out of his mind. There we go. And I, I know this is an intro show, but for all of the... Um people who are already using satellite and are looking to upgrade. I've had multiple questions on this so far. Um, go through the upgrade guide. And especially, I want to draw attention to uh, a foreman maintain command where you have to fix the permissions. Make sure you run that. Otherwise, you might uh, find that you'll, you'll run into problems. But. Uh, yep. In, I was, yes. was going to say, yeah, that's been my experience as well in, in working with a lot of customers over the years is if you follow the documentation for upgrading satellite, things will go pretty smoothly. If you try to just wing it and, and you know, figure it out on your own, your results might vary. So I would, like Matthew said, I definitely recommend, you know, review the documentation. The upgrade procedure is a little bit different with 6.10 um, than it has been in the past. There's some extra steps like Matthew said, so you definitely want to look at all those steps and make sure um, you're following the documentation there. And uh, am I sharing my screen? I don't think I am. Or was I, and now I'm not. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Welcome to a live show, folks. Anything that can't go wrong will go wrong. OK, so you guys can see that now? Yep. And now so can our audience. OK, cool. Um, so, like Brian was alluding to just now, there are a bunch of additional steps from your regular upgrade, and I'll 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 give you the reasons for that. Um, so I don't want to spend too long on the new features of 6.10 because this is meant to be an intro show. But uh, for those of you looking for a reason to upgrade, because I know everybody loves upgrading, um, we are migrating the backend from pulp two to pulp three. And what that means is the content management system is being upgraded. Um, there's a couple of reasons for that. This is to prepare all of our current customers for a future update to satellite 7.0. And so a lot of the, I would say if like in terms of doing an upgrade, um, the most time consuming part of that upgrade, we're asking you to do that right now with 6.10. Uh, we've included a bunch of 
migration slash upgrade tooling in six, uh, sorry, let me step back a bit. So in order to upgrade, you're gonna need to, to make sure you're on the latest, uh, what we call Zstream release of 6.9. So that would be 6.9.7. That includes a bunch of upgrade tooling and in the upgrade manual, we'll tell you how to use that upgrade tooling to migrate your Pulp 2 content into Pulp 3. Uh, without going too deep into it, the upgrade process is now, or at least the migration process from Pulp 2 to Pulp 3 is, shall, I'm gonna use this term anyway, but it's item potent. So you can run it as many times as you want. You can stop the operation and rerun the operation. It's designed to make the upgrade process as painless as possible. So uh, because it's a very time consuming process, we want you to be able to complete it on your own time whenever is convenient. And once the migration is done, the upgrade uh, is very uh, timely. We're estimating it'll take like 20 minutes for you to run after you've upgraded the pulp backend. So anyway, you mentioned, you mentioned yeah, go ahead, to... Eric to stop and restart this uh, this this upgrade process. So is that something that when I leave the office at six o'clock, I can kick this off as I'm walking out the door. And if it's not done, say by the, the next morning, uh, when I get into the office around eight or 9 a.m., I can stop it. That way my my satellite server isn't, uh, isn't, isn't hung up during the day when we're trying to work with our different environments or or even it's, it's it's actually better than that. So let's say you ignored my advice just now to run the preparation script. Your migration will actually fail. So what you can then do is you can go back and run the migration or the preparation script like I asked you to, and then you can kick off the um, migration all over again and it should complete properly. That's what it's really used for. That's awesome. That's, that's great to have that uh, kind of that check and balance in place. Uh, because I don't, I don't know about any of our listeners, but I know as a former sysadmin, reading the manual was not exactly high on my <laughs> priority list. It was just go do the thing and move on to the next fire. So the one of one of the reasons why we've made the upgrade process like this is because because it takes a long time. It's hard to predict how long it's going to take. We have a command that will do an analysis on your Pulp 2 backend and give you an estimate, but we don't know for sure how long it's going to take. So let's say we estimated three hours, but it really took one hour. And then in between that two hours, um, there were some synchronization updates that were done. Um, you're gonna wanna run that upgrade script one more time before you actually do the switch over to 6.10. That's, that's another reason why you would do that. Um, I think I've spent way too much time on this. Just real quick, um, we are collapsing, like some of the benefits here, we are collapsing the structured data from two databases to one. We are getting rid of MongoDB and moving all of that data into PostgreSQL. Um, there is Ansible content support, which allows for um, synchronization of uh, Ansible collections so that you can then synchronize those with your uh, Ansible automation hub. And we've got some disconnected air-gapped content enhancement. So we, we can permit versioning of the content database. That means you can now do incremental exports of the content to another disconnected satellite. And I think that's all I wanna say about um, 6.10 so far. Um, because this is an intro, I wanted to really get into the demo and show you what this all looks like. So any, do you guys have any questions? Haven't seen anything in chat. Brian, you got anything? Uh, no, no, yeah, no, that's, that seemed like a great overview. Yeah, thanks, Matthew. Yeah, no problem. Um, where is my tab to log in? Here it is. So I'm gonna log in. Um, Using a password manager, always good. Yes, um, I only make use of the best security practices. That's not true. I usually ignore them. 
funny <laughs> enough, I started using a password manager because I was lazy and didn't want to have to type out my password all the time. I've since adopted oh. more advanced security practices like using 18 character randomly generated passwords. I don't know any of my passwords anymore. So Isn't if, it great? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I know how to log into my password manager. After that, I got nothing. <laughs> exactly. Anyway, the, this this is your your friendly uh, rel uh, rel public service announcement for for this episode. Use a password <laughs> manager, and now back to satellite. So here we got. This is what well, this is what you have when you first log in. Um, gives you an overview of what's happening. Uh, what can I say about this? These are the hosts that I have uh, included into my satellite. Um, you may, you guys may have noticed that I am running 6.10. Uh, I installed 6.10 yesterday, and then I added these hosts, and it looks like they work properly. Um, for those people who don't know, Satellite 6, at least the 6 branch, runs on Red Hat Enterprise Linux 7. We don't have support for RHEL 8 yet. That is coming with Satellite 7.0 which is the next release. Uh, you guys may be wondering, well, why is that? Um, the flat out, the real reason is we don't have time. We need to check it. And there were higher priorities that we needed to work on to dump into satellite 6.10, which is why we currently don't have support for 8.0 of uh, RHEL yet. So, so Matthew, what about if I have RHEL, like RHEL 8 clients? Can, oh, can no I, problem can, with those. Okay. Rel 8 clients okay. will work. Um, okay. We're also going to include Rel 9 support with uh, 7.0. In other words, Rel 9 clients uh, with Satellite 7.0. Okay. Um, a real quick rundown. One of the first things you're going to do when you install Satellite is you are going to export your subscriptions. In other words, you'll create something called a manifest uh, within uh, access.redhot.com. You'll export that manifest file, and then you'll add it to your satellite. So that way, you now have a remote copy of all of your uh, entitlements. The next thing you're probably going to do is you're going to add a bunch of repositories that you want to sync down into your satellite. So you can search for any number of uh, repositories. Just type it in here. Obviously, this is Red Hat. Oh, I shouldn't put that there. It's actually rel. Anyway, you see all the stuff that's supported uh, for RHEL 8 right here. I've added the AppStream repo and the base OS repo. Um, once you've done that, you're going to want to synchronize them. So the default synchronization mode for uh, Red Hat Satellite is to not download the yum packages that you'll that you'll associate with the um, uh, repository. Yeah, this is the one I wanted to show. What the default synchronization mode is going to pull down all of the metadata associated with those yum packages, and there's a reason for that. Um, it takes a long time and a lot of bandwidth to suck these down. Um, these packages will be pulled through when you add your clients and your clients do an update or they install new YUM packages. So, uh, now, so now, sorry, remember, go ahead. Yeah, so I remember when when I used Satellite way back in like the 5.4 days that you didn't really have an option. You just, you subscribe to a repository and you had to pull down, like in this case, all 21, 21 thousand packages and like you said that takes a lot of bandwidth a lot of disk space uh, but it sounds like we've we've kind of gone to an as needed basis is is that a good way to uh, to describe that well that that's the default behavior and I like I haven't been around here long enough but if I had to guess the reason why we made that the default behavior is we didn't want to shock any new satellite uh, users 
into suddenly filling up all their um, drives with uh, packages. However, I will say, if you really want to, you can synchronize them down uh, fully if you really wanted to. Yeah, and, and that helps especially with a disconnected environment. Maybe it's not something that's air-gapped, but if it's if it's disconnected or it has, you only want to open up that that firewall ports, say when you're when you're refreshing your your patching cycle or something. That that's a great way to 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 handle that. But as as far as most businesses are are concerned, and and my own satellite server here at home. Uh, I don't need 21,000 packages sitting on my satellite server. <laughs> Chances are I'm not going to use 95% of them because I'm not going to get deep into kernel development or I'm not a developer, so I don't need all the different programming languages. So having an always-on connection, it, it really helps to pull down all the metadata. So it's got that, that map of dependencies and all that kind of thing. And then when I go to, to trigger an update from satellite or when I go and install a one-off package, uh, from one of my satellite registered clients, it's nice to know that then that client is talking to the satellite server, satellite is talking to our to Red Hat CDN, and it pulls down exactly the packages and exactly the repo uh, the the dependencies that I need. And so you're you're talking about you know megabytes worth of worth of space versus gigabytes for something that you're hardly even going to touch ever. And, and this and, makes and just sorry sorry to interrupt. Go ahead, Brian. I was just going to say that the, the on-demand repositories make setting up a satellite server, a new satellite server, so much faster. Whereas before, if you had a bunch of repositories, I mean, you could be looking at hours, even days, to pull all that content down, depending on your connection speed. Whereas with on-demand, it's extremely quick, and you can get up and running and, and start serving that content. And, Did and just for a frame of... A... We just keep walking all yeah, over. Sorry, you. Eric. That's but... okay, man. Um... Uh, did 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 either of you ever uh, ever have like a a, a repo sync uh, spreadsheet? I I when, when I was running satellite, uh, I literally had a spreadsheet that was like color coded based on okay between between two a.m. and three a.m. we're going to sync like Red Hat satellite or Red Hat uh, RHEL five packages, and then between three and four in the morning we're going to sync. Uh, sync rel six packages. I mean, we literally had to spreadsheet, and it it was so tough back back in those days that we actually worked with the the backup teams uh, to make sure that we were doing a uh, that we weren't going to step on when they were using like the storage area network, just to make sure that satellite and backups and all these other things, and and it was all spreadsheet driven. It was it was miserable. <laughs> I've only ever worked in environments where um, my method for gaining access to content was to yell at the network guy to give me access to the proxy, or <laughs> even better, uh, just open up the outgoing connections. Um, the, the, but the thing I wanted to draw attention to, which I kept interrupting you guys, and I'm really sorry about that, um, no worries. Just, for, just for perspective, the AppStream repository with those 21,000 packages is about 60 gigs. The base OS is probably, I want to say it's about five gigs. But uh, if, about right. if, yeah. Um, now, for our, for our viewers, you might be saying, well, that's not a big deal. Why wouldn't, why wouldn't I want to sync all of these down? And that's an entirely reasonable statement. But for large organizations, when you start including all the extra stuff, and by extra stuff, I mean like, I don't know, Ansible, JBoss, all that stuff. Um, it starts to get big pretty quick. And that's not even including custom content that you want to add to satellite. Um, we've spent quite a bit of time talking about repos. Um, shall we Wait, get into- Are you into... about to tell me that satellite does more than just repository management? Well, <laughs> I wanted to I wanted to actually show you guys what was going on and how it worked. Um, one of the so what what I'm going to do is jump into activation keys. Um, so I'm going to show you here. I got one for rel seven. One of the first things you're going to do after you've pulled your content down is you're going to want to create an activation key. And uh, what you end up doing is with this act. This is your activation key right here. 
I feel comfortable showing this to everybody because if you ran it right now, it wouldn't do anything because you're not connected to my satellite. Anyway, this activation key is uh, associated with um, a bunch of repositories and it's rel7. And I gave it access to all of these repositories. So once you've added it to your host, uh, you'll be able to do updates from those repos. So um, I'm going to jump into my uh, rel host here, my, my remote rel host. Um, let's hope this works. <laughs> said everyone who's done a live demo ever. Yeah. Okay. Everybody can see that now, right? Yep. Yeah, looks good. So I'm going to do very little typing here, actually, because it's a live demo. <laughs> 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 um, I am, as you can see, this is in uh, EC2. One of the first things I need to do here, and you, you will probably not to do that, you will probably not need to do this in your own environment, but uh, I'm going to remove the Red Hat Update Infrastructure Client, or RUI as we refer to it, uh, because I don't want my host updating from RUI. I want it to actually update from satellite. So one more time, just to, just to be clear, this step is probably not necessary in your environment unless you are in Amazon. Uh, then I'm going to do a yum clean all. And then I am going to do this, which is to enable subscription manager to manage the repos. Okay, so thus ends the optional stuff. Here's the mandatory stuff. Um, so this is So you'll see it's running rel um, 8.4. I'm going to join it up to my um, satellite. This step is very important, and I'll explain what this does. So Catello CA consumer IP, this package, this is a custom package created by my satellite which then configures Subscription Manager to point to my satellite. If you don't do this step and you run Subscription Manager, it's gonna to point to the Red Hat CDN and start um, doing stuff off of the uh, CDN. Make sense? Yeah, that sounds good. good. And now I'm going to Use the activation key I created previously. This might take a little bit of time. And once this is complete, oh, there it is. Once it's completed, we can do a subscription manager repos. And you can see here that it is now pointing to the particular IP I have for my satellite within Amazon. So the next step, um, let's do a yum update, shall we? It's always a good plan. And, and if it were me, uh, mostly because I use this as a giant sledgehammer, oh. any, anytime I'm doing a, an update or any kind of um, yum operation, uh, I, I usually lead with a yum clean all just out of sheer paranoia. Um, it, seems like, uh, it seems like when you're doing any kind of uh, maintenance window that uh, <laughs> it seems like there's always some, some metadata that's, that's expired and uh, or some dependency that hasn't been sorted out. So if you do a yum clean all and then do a, a yum update, um, it, it pulls all that stuff fresh. And, and I'd, I'd encourage that even more because you are switching repositories. 
and, and not just not just repos, but you're you're completely changing where that content's coming from. So I, I have noticed in the past, maybe not so much recently, but I have noticed when switching from Red Hat CDN to uh, to a satel a local satellite server that I've I've run into issues with that before. So just a, a fun uh, a fun tip. It's it's kind of like rebooting a, a Windows machine. Usually, a yum clean all fixes all all problems. Brian's laughing, so I I know he's seen this before in in the wild. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yum clean all is is a very useful command. <laughs> Just so you guys know, what I'm doing down here is uh, I also have a newly provisioned. Rel seven box. I'm going to add that as well to my satellite. And I am going to apply the Rel seven key. Oh, you know what I forgot? I did not download the Catello CA and install it. So you didn't I read the manual. Exactly. All of these sins, like bad security practices, not reading the manual, <laughs> running everything as root. Do we even yeah. work for Red Hat? Like. <laughs> It, do, do as we say, not as we do. Yeah. <laughs> My excuse is this is a live demo. Right, right. Few, fewer, fewer obstacles, the better. Yeah, it, exactly. That one actually. Oh, it was unable to find. So this is a good one here. I'm going to draw everybody's attention to this. Don't worry about it. Just ignore it. <laughs> Um, that's what I wanted to do. So, while so I've those, got everything updating. So while those updates are running, I wanted to point out, um, if you are on the Twitters, uh, you can follow us at Red Hat Rel. Um, that that is a newer uh, Twitter handle that we've we've started uh, we started up in the past week or so, um, so you can get news about this show, about Red Hat uh, Enterprise Linux uh, events that are upcoming, and anything that uh, that may uh, that may pertain to Rel. Um, and I believe uh, Red Hat Satellite has one as well, and I think that's at Red Hat Satellite. And if you if you want to engage with the show directly, you can tag us on social media, at, uh, and we've been using hashtag RelPresents. Um, so just a little public service announcement. Uh, I usually hate uh, when when uh, shows do this, but we're as you can see with with some of the new content, some of the new guests, and having a a, a new uh, a new host and a new co-host. Uh, shows undergoing a lot of changes. We're growing it. We're we're uh, and so tell tell a friend if you don't have any friends go out on Twitter all of your all of your friends are there <laughs> so, <laughs> so just a, a quick uh, quick public service announcement of course like and subscribe the episode um, so it looks like uh, looks like your rel eight box is getting close to being updated yeah I was thinking about it. <laughs> yeah I love that it always gets to the last action and it's like do I do I really want to be done? Am I sure? Let me think about this. Unless um, one Lopez has already hacked into my satellite. <laughs> <laughs> so so Matthew, while, while this is running, how do how do content views affect the, like these kind of updates you're doing? How do, how does that work? Right. So. Uh, it, just to sum it up real quick, let's say you have um, you have rel seven repos, you have rel eight repos, you have rel six and rel five re, uh, repos. You don't want, and then um, one of the things you can do, which I don't recommend doing, is you can make them all available under one activation key. Do you really want all of those repos available to anyone? in your network that has that activation key. 
I, there's, I mean, you certainly can. I don't know if it's bad, but at the same time, if you really wanted to, and let's say you are a very controlling sysadmin, we give you the choice to create a subset of all of those uh, repos. In other words, a subset of that content so that you can uh, associate that with a an activation key. So just to reiterate, content views are for creating subs access subsets uh, to, to your content so that not all of it is given to everybody. Yeah, and another, another way I've talked about this before too is it's it's freezing that content at a point in time, right? So like a situation you want to avoid, let's say you have like three environments, you know, dev, test, and prod in your environment, and you're gonna go ahead and patch, you know, you're gonna update dev today, okay? And then two weeks later, you know, now I wanna update test. Well, if you're not using satellite and not using content views, in those two weeks that have passed, there might be additional updates you've got, you're getting now in your test environment from RHEL that we've released in those two weeks. Okay, and let's say two weeks later, now you go to update prod. And again, if you're not using satellite, you just do a yum update, it's gonna pull the latest content. There could have even been a minor release. It could have gone from 8.4 to 8.5 in those two weeks that have passed. And now you're installing RHEL 8.5 in prod and you've never tested that out in your, your dev and test environment. So with a content view, you can you, you take that you, you make a content view. It's that point in time snapshot, and you update all three environments, dev, test, and prod from that same content view, and they get the exact same access to content. And so you're you're not having that situation where prod's getting later content than than dev or test. That's exactly what I was going to say, Brian. Thank you. <laughs> And then, and one other, one other cool feature I'll throw out with, with content views that I that I really like is you can exclude content too. So, um, say you know like the Emacs package, for example, you know you could exclude that from your content view, and so your you know your users couldn't install that. So, if there's certain packages you you want to exclude out of there. Um, just so you guys can see, I have finished updating my rel 8 host and I'm just rebooting it. I'll just log back in again. If you look at rel presents episode 24 from two weeks ago, you're going to actually see uh, Matthew, uh, Don, uh, Scott, and myself talking about uh, rel 8.5 and all the cool new stuff. And, and Matthew even gave an impromptu demo of system roles. So definitely go check that out um, as, uh, as the system's rebooted. I am going to switch over to the satellite interface, satellite UI, because Perfect. I'll tell you guys what I'm going to do next. Can you guys see that? We can. Yeah, cool. Okay. So both hosts should be showing up now, as they both are. So that's my RHEL 8 host and my RHEL seven host. A note about this, um, you may recall earlier, I did a cat Etsy Red Hat release um, and it showed Red Hat 8.4. Well, now it's showing 8.5 because I've done a reboot and um, or an update and a reboot. Why isn't it logged in yet? It's still, still booting. Um, and uh, it's the new version. Rel, uh, my rel seven host is currently updating, but is not complete. So um, it's going to take some time before it's ready. Um, we've got 15 minutes left. I wanted to show one more cool feature, uh, and that's remote execution. Um, what I'm going to do with remote execution is install the um, Insights client. And what that means is I'll be able to use or view the client at some point on console.redhot.com and use insights to take a look at what's wrong with it. Or I can even look through here through the um, insights interface, which is, where is insights? <laughs> Uh, 
Uh, yeah, right there. Go back to. Uh, uh, yeah, right, right there under Red Hat Cloud. Right here. That's right. Oh, I haven't configured this yet. <sighs> okay, I'll do that later. Um. So before before we move on to uh, to the next leg, uh, David and the YouTube chat actually had a good question. Uh, do you have any comments on install and configuration of a disconnected satellite server? Um, so I've never done this myself, but here's how I think I would do it. I would have my satellite server. Um, I would have two satellite servers installed and uh, through a connected network. Then I would disconnect the, shall we say, the disconnected satellite server, move it into the air-gapped environment. And yeah, that would probably be it. Now, after you've done the initial installation, you can then use, um, it's a hammer CLI command to do the export of the content from the um, primary uh, satellite, primary online satellite, and walk it over to your disconnected satellite. Yeah, and we have, we have documentation that talks a lot about that. It's called Inner Satellite Sync, um, or ISS. I don't know if that's a play on the, the whole space and satellite thing, but, but anyways, um, yeah, Inner Satellite Sync. Um, it, it's it's documented how to how to do you know export the content and port it in there on, on your on your disconnected satellite server. Um, so, uh, just to show you what. Okay, I'm going to go back and start this over again because I don't think I'm doing a very good job explaining what's going on here. So I'm in the hosts view, all hosts. I'm gonna click on this host here. These two hosts, um, 29.5 and 29.6, both don't uh, have the Insights client installed yet. And then what I'm gonna do is edit this host and I'm going to, you know what? I don't think I have imported the rules yet. No, I haven't. Okay, so this is a really fresh version of satellite that I have running. Um, th what I'm about to do is one of the initial steps you're gonna run yourself uh, after you've done an installation. So one of those is to import the Ansible rules. <clears throat> And for those of you that don't know, um, Red Hat Satellite comes with a few default uh, roles or playbooks. And it's also compatible with our other favorite product, uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux system rules, which I actually know I have installed on here. <laughs> that's, that's Brian's baby right now. <laughs> <laughs> and we, and we, did, we did just publish a blog on, on how to use uh, system roles with, with satellite. So if you, if you want to get more information on that, um, I'll try to post that here in the chat. So I'm going to add the Red Hat Insights client to the server. And now I'm going to go back and run that role against this server. So again, just so just in case you didn't see it, go to hosts, all hosts, select the host, click on edit, click on Ansible roles, and then add this or assign it to this host. And now I'm gonna run it. So run the Ansible role. And that's going to install the client. You can see the progress by clicking on the host name there. And this is expected. It's unreachable. And that's because, for those that don't know, Ansible requires SSH. Well, it, re it uses SSH. And I haven't imported the public key from the uh, satellite server into my host yet. So I got to do that. And you do that by. I'm going to swap screens again. Yeah, I got you. OK, and I'm going to swap over to my Terminator.
And as root, you do that. You can also use SSH copy dash ID to do it, which is probably a better way of doing it than what I just did. Um, but there's instructions on this in Brian's blog, actually. So I'm going to go back to the satellite interface. That's keeping me on my toes today. <laughs> um, hmm. OK. I'm going to rerun this job. The reason why you see me going, hmm, is because I was actually looking for this button. Rerun. I'm going to submit it. And I'm going to click on the host name. Here we go. That's looking good. So remote execution is really handy. You can basically do anything and apply it to any number of hosts. So let's say you had 100 hosts. You could remote execute against all 100 of them which means that you can also run commands like yum install or dnf install, some kind of package, and install that on your host. I'm uh, in the background here. I'm going to log into my rel 7 host. And I'll show you one more thing. And I think the power of satellite comes in from a lot of the different tools that the Red Hat has been in. Uh, has, has been expanding on between system roles, uh, image builder, satellite. Uh, I mean, I, if, if, you, if you look at a greenfield uh, infrastructure nowadays, it would be so easy to create all the stuff using infrastructure's code, golden images, uh, and just lay all this stuff out, si set, up, uh, set up different roles and profiles in satellite, have, have your content views, which we didn't go too deep into on this episode, but having all of those things, you could, you could literally tear down your entire infrastructure and with the click of a button, rebuild it from basically nothing. Just use Image Builder to, to create a template, have that, have that Image Builder image tie into your satellite system so when, when it first boots, your, your system registers with insights and with satellite. And then you can, use, you can use remote execution, you can use scheduled jobs, you can use different profiles to, um, using profiles as, as a generic term, to define that this is gonna be a database server. So my database users need to have access to it. It needs these, it needs these, uh, re these additional repositories for this database. And, and basically just sitting back as, as, a, as an operator instead of as a systems administrator, I, I don't have to go in and do this on 500 servers anymore. Instead, it really is a step closer to that, that dream of having infrastructure as code and having an infrastructure that is the same across every platform, across every infrastructure base, whether that's virtual, bare metal, cloud, or some kind of hybrid of, of all the above. This just gets so powerful as, as a systems administrator. And, and Eric, another, just on that train of thought, we also know how the satellite Ansible collection that's supported, mm. and you can you can use that to you know write code to implement your satellite server. You know, automate the installation and configuration of of you know of of your satellite resources, either repositories, you know, all the steps that that Matthew was showing earlier of enabling repositories. You can enable that through a playbook using that satellite Ansible collection. Yeah, that's a great point. And and just before we finish this uh, live stream, I'm going to install Vim on uh, these two hosts that I just uh, configured. And you do that by going back and, well, there's multiple ways of doing it. Um, for the purposes of this demo, I'm just gonna show, show you how to do it by going to all hosts, clicking on the two hosts that you want, going to schedule remote job. And it's a command we wanna run. It'll run it through SSH. The command we'll run is yum install minus y vim. And hopefully this works. Yeah, this is working. <laughs> 
cool, right? So I'm going to hit back. I'm going to go to the other host. Oof. I install a lot of stuff here. <laughs> and it's done. But to your, to your point, imagine having to do that same process across 100 nodes. Instead, you just you clicked it, ran it once, and and you came in and... And, and we shouldn't, but as technologists, we were actually surprised it worked on the first try. <laughs> <laughs> this is a live demo. That's why we're, right. I'm surprised it all works. And that's so all we, I wanted to show today. We've, we've got a couple of minutes left, and uh, Rope9, uh, or our Hope9 probably, uh, put a good comment into chat about... Um, about how all this all this works well using these different tools, but that's what containers excel at. Uh, Brian or Matt, do you uh, do you have a, a comment? Um, I kind of posted in chat that you know it's it's just another way of getting to the same place. We we all know that within within technology, there's a hundred ways to do any one thing. But do you want to talk to the container story specifically? I'll I'll give if, if you don't mind, I'll go real fast and I'll go sure. first, Brian. Um, but... You know, a common a common gripe I hear with customers is they all want to do containers, but they don't know what to use them for. Um, so yeah, absolutely use containers. And if you've got a if you work for a, a business that's been around, um, has lots of hosts, um, has a real critical need for advanced infrastructure, um, absolutely go for it. Um, but not everybody's going to be like you, is what I'm going to say. And um, not everybody is going to understand how to use containers, how to build a CI/CD pipeline. Um, uh, I mean, a lot of people out there, I don't know, um, how many businesses are using some form of Git or GitHub internally to manage their source code? I, I think it should be all, but... Um, I don't think that's always the case. Well, Brian, I, I what do you think? Like, before I hand it over to Brian, I wanted to add just one quick comment on that. Uh, one of the things that I kind of heard in between the lines of what you're saying was with, with something like Podman and containers, there, there, there seems to be a threshold somewhere, um, and it comes up a lot quicker than you think, where just managing Podman containers by hand starts to get it out of hand. It starts to become untenable. Uh, and that's that's when you start thinking about something like an orchestrator, something like Red Hat OpenShift, uh, or just straight Kubernetes. So while, while running three or four containers may be great, while even running a dozen containers on a single node or a couple of different nodes may work to begin with, it's one of those things that can quickly get out of hand, especially with something as small and as prolific as, as a container. Uh, so using something like satellite in an existing infrastructure would definitely definitely help. Um, I, I look at it as om almost a spectrum of not everyone's going to use containers at all. Some people will have three or four, and that's enough for them. Other people start out using a couple, and then within a couple of quarters, they realize that we have a 1,000 containers, no way to schedule any of them. We need an orchestrator. Uh, so that that's kind of what I heard uh, as you were talking, Matt. Go ahead, but Brian. also, so I got one more. I got one more uh, wrench to throw in the the works here. If you need persistent, if you need persistent storage, how many people know how to manage that? Right. It it is a different skill set required for sure. Yeah. So I mean, someone's going to say, "Hey, I'm going to use an object storage system for persistent storage." How many how many organizations out there actually have some sort of object storage to um, locally to manage all this stuff? Anyway, sorry. Brian, what Go do you ahead, think? Brian. Yeah, no, I think I think I think you guys covered it really well. I mean, the key takeaway is, you know, if you if you want to run just just rel, we have that covered. If you want to run some containers, you know, we have Podman, and if you want to do a lot of containers, we have OpenShift. So no matter where you're at, you know, with with if you want to use containers, don't want to use containers, you know, we have solutions to help you out with that. 
with that, we are at the top of the hour, and I wanted to uh, first off thank you, Matt, very much for for coming on to two episodes in a row and talking about uh, talking about satellite. Uh, I know that uh, this was long overdue, 25 episodes before we even mentioned, uh, before we even demoed Satellite. I know we've mentioned it in passing, but uh, thank you so much for coming on back-to-back -back, uh, episodes and, and, and demoing different pieces of Satellite. Uh, in fact, uh, if, if you watch this episode, please post in the comments. Uh, we've been toying with the idea of doing a Satellite like mini-series and just kind of touching on some of the different major categories of, of satellite. Um, so if you'd be interested in a satellite focused mini series, uh, put it in the comments, uh, put it in our discord server. Um, and then I would be remiss if I didn't promote our next episode and in two weeks, join, uh, Brian Smith and, uh, father Linux himself. Uh, that's his Twitter handle, uh, Scott McCarty. Uh, he is another, he's one of the product manager or product managers here at Red Hat. Um, we are going to talk about all things containers. So we're going to talk about Podman. Um, I, there was a question about, uh, there's, there's a question about logging with, with Podman. So come back in two weeks, same time, same channels, um, uh, and we'll, we'll promote that. But I did want to add that there is a little bit of a twist to our, our, our look at Podman with, with it being the beginning of December and we're kind of winding down for the, for the year. We're all kind of, uh, kind of looking forward to that extended break at the, at the end of December. We're going to add a little bit of a fun twist to it, and we're going to deploy a gaming server on uh, using Podman. So we, we haven't decided which one, whether that's, that's Minecraft or something else, but um, definitely something I'm looking forward to. It'll be a great conversation, and Scott is, is a lot of fun. Um, so tune back in in two weeks, and we'll have that episode. Uh, Brian, any, any closing thoughts before we get out of here? No, just thanks so much, Matthew. This was awesome. No problem. I uh, really enjoyed it. Uh, hope to be back on again sometime. Well, I've, I've already gotten a vote in chat that the Penguin Whisperer would like a satellite miniseries. So if the Penguin Whisperer says says we should have a satellite miniseries, we probably should. But uh, we'll, we'll look at doing that sometime next year. Um, but until then, thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, be sure to like and subscribe this video and our channel. Join us every two weeks. And uh, definitely follow us on Twitter at Red Hat Rel. And you can follow Satellite at Red Hat Satellite, uh, both on Twitter. Brian, Matt, thank you guys so much. And we'll see you all in two weeks. <laughs>